The Lord be with you. Grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. On behalf of the session of Heidenwood Presbyterian Church, we welcome you all to this service of worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. Quick programming note before we carry on with our service, we are delighted to welcome Mike Daniels to our worship service today. Mike is currently the principal cellist for the Virginia Symphony, and you can read more about him in our bulletin today. I encourage you to check that out, but most importantly, I encourage you to reach out to Mike to welcome him and to thank him for sharing his gifts for music with us here today. And now, friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it together. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, out of your good pleasure, you offer us your holy realm. So as we worship you this morning with scripture, song, and prayer, help to take away our fixation on worldly treasures. Pry us loose from our possessions. Give us open hearts and hands and spirits of humble service. Make us ready to meet you, even at an unexpected hour, and the coming of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to join with me in reading our call to worship. The Mighty One speaks and calls out to the earth. Our God is coming. The Righteous One gathers the faithful from east and west. We come with thanksgiving as our sacrifice. We come to worship God. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing our opening hymn.
You may be seated. If we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is righteous and just, will forgive us and extend to us his everlasting mercy. So now, with trust in the grace offered to us in Jesus Christ, let us confess our sins together with the prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Holy God, you promise us a life full of blessing, but we do not always believe. You invite us to hope, but we fall back into fear. You urge us to give freely, but we cling to what we have. You call us to watch at all times for you, but we grow lazy and self-absorbed. Forgive us. Increase our hope, enlarge our hearts, and keep us alert to the wonders you work in the world every day. For the sake of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ lived for us. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power over us. And anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. The new life has come. So friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Friends, the peace of God has been offered to us in Jesus Christ and through the ever-present power of the Holy Spirit. So let us share that peace with the entire world and let us begin here and now with one another. So whether you're with us in the sanctuary today or watching with us online, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Friends, please be seated. Friends, please be seated to make way for our little ones. As we make our way down, we're almost here.
I brought a special bag today to share with you. Okay, that's always exciting to find out what's in a special bag. First of all, though, I need to ask you a question. Do you know what a treasure is? Okay, yes, a treasure can be lots of things. I bet you know what a treasure is, don't you? Can you share something about a treasure? Um, well, I think in the fairy tales, um, pirates bury it. Yes, and uh, my whole life I always tried to find a pirate treasure, and guess what? I never did. Sometimes we are told that we should plan for things and maybe save money for something special, like maybe a trip to Disney World. Sometimes children will have something called a piggy bank. Now, this is a very special piggy bank because it belongs to one of my grandchildren. And it has a particular university on it that's not necessarily my favorite, OK? But do you hear the treasure in there? That's money because my grandson is saving for something special. I can, I can hear that money because it's coins. But sometimes mommies and daddies have paper money. And paper money you can spend even better. Like this. Whoa. Yes, I'm going to share one with you, OK? But we have to sit. This money is so special, even though it's play money, it's so special because it has special words on it. God tells us that not only should we save for special things that we want, but we should really save for special things in heaven. We should try to lay up our treasure in heaven. I think I'm going to start with the big kids to help me out today. Can you please choose one piece of money? She's looking. I think she's going to take the 20. Surprise, surprise. Turn it over. What does it say? Say you're sorry when you hurt someone. Ooh, a good way to have a treasure is to say you're sorry when you hurt somebody's feelings. Oh, yeah, just tell your mommy, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings, mommy, when I didn't do what you asked me to do. Yes. Another big kid. Wait just a minute, darling. Can you turn yours over and read it into the microphone? Give money to the poor. Some people don't have any treasures. We might need to help them. And that's a good way to have a treasure in heaven. Can you pull one out? Can you let someone read it for you? It says, pray for one another. Always remember to pray for each other, especially when they're sad. Can you choose one, please? She wants this. Okay, can you let someone read it for you? It says, smile and be nice to others. Can everybody smile at everybody out there? That makes us feel better. OK, today, Pastor Andrew is going to talk about treasures in heaven. So I'm going to give him the last two. Well, I think I've got three. Help feed the hungry. That's a good way to help get treasures in heaven. 
be a friend to someone who is lonely, that's a good way to have treasures in heaven. And one more, forgive someone who has hurt you. Can we say a prayer together, please? Our Father God, thank you for all the blessings. And please help us to be a blessing, too, to make your world better, to improve your creation in all the ways we can. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet, to open our hearts and minds through the power of your Holy Spirit. Through that spirit, enlighten us, illumine us, inspire us, and not for our sakes, but for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom we live and breathe and pray. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, 
chapter 12, verses 32 through 40. Listen for the word of the Lord. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. He comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so. Blessed are those slaves. But know this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is the word of the Lord. I love a good science fiction story. And my favorite subgenre of science fiction is the post-apocalyptic drama, a story that takes place after some horrible catastrophe has wiped out most of humanity. Chipper, I know. And I am especially fond of the subgenre within this subgenre that is the lone survivor story. You know the kind. But there is one person left standing after the world has fallen apart, and they have to struggle to protect themselves from external threats like plagues or radiation or zombies. But they also must protect themselves from internal threats, like grief, despair, loneliness. One of the classics of this genre is I Am Legend, written by Richard Matheson and first published in 1954. A story about a lone survivor in a world that has been taken over by vampires. Sounds silly, I know, but it's actually a heartbreaking story about a man struggling with crippling loneliness, struggling to keep his sanity intact while he struggles to survive day by day. And like many science fiction stories of its era, it was a story written in response to the development of nuclear weapons, a story that was a response to the suddenly very real possibility that we could wipe ourselves out. Now, the book, I Am Legend, has been adapted for the silver screen at least three times, and each time it was a new response to some threat or worry or external existential crisis in our national imagination. There was 1964's adaptation, The Last Man on Earth, starring Vincent Price. There was the 1971 version, The Omega Man, starring Charlton Heston. Both of these can be viewed as responses to Cold War worries about nuclear war. Most recently, there was 2007's I Am Legend starring Will Smith, which was just one of numerous end-of-the-world post-apocalyptic lone survivor stories of the time. You may remember a bunch of these coming out in the early 2000s. Movies about plagues and zombies wiping out the human race. Well, many film scholars think that there was a surge in this type of movie in the early 2000s as a response to our fears about biological terrorism and our fears about our growing polarization, ways we are no longer viewing our neighbors as friends and loved ones, but as people to be suspicious of, perhaps even to fear. Now, I find these kinds of stories fascinating because they offer us a window into our collective psyche, A window into our national imagination. They also function as a kind of mirror, reflecting back to us in gruesome detail all of our most deeply rooted fears and suspicions about our neighbors. There are others, however, who view these types of books and films and TV shows less as artistic expressions and more as how-to guides. 
manuals for surviving the apocalypse. Maybe fascinated as I was fascinated to find out that whenever there is a surge in post apocalyptic movies, there is also a coinciding surge in demand for doomsday bunkers, as well as for weapons and ammunition. Which, of course, awkwardly brings me to our scripture lesson this morning from the Gospel of Luke. What we seem to have here at first glance is a group of three teachings that Luke has kind of smushed together. First, Jesus talks about uh, storing up treasure in heaven and being generous to other people. Then he mentions a story about keeping lamps lit by slaves as they wait in anticipation for their master to come home from a party. And then he transitions into this strange comment about a thief breaking into a house and not knowing when to expect that thief to come in. It can sound a little disjointed when you read all of these together, but there is a uniting theme. And that theme for these teachings is this. Get ready. Get ready. Be prepared. Be prepared because the kingdom of God is breaking into the world. Jesus is going to return and we better be ready. This is, I would suggest to you, Jesus' own version of doomsday prepping. Thankfully, without all the bunkers, guns, Purell, or zombies. Now, I will be the first to admit that I get a little perplexed and sometimes a little uncomfortable whenever Jesus starts talking about the second coming or the last judgment or any of those other end-time themes we find throughout the New Testament. Our fun theological word for this type of theme, by the way, is eschatology, study of the end times or end things. But lately, I have found myself thinking about how vitally important it is for us to look at texts like these. Because for a variety of reasons, I believe we once again find ourselves in a period in our history where there is a lot of doomsday chatter, a lot of doomsday prepping. And this doomsday undercurrent in our national imagination is something to take seriously. Because it's something that doesn't just pop up in movies or on TV or in literature. Another manifestation of this apocalyptic fixation can also be seen in the rise and spread of Christian nationalism. Now, for the sake of our sermon this morning, Christian nationalism can simply be defined as the view that our nation, the United States, should be an exclusively Christian nation, that our laws should be based solely on the Bible, or really, certain people's interpretation of the Bible, whatever that might actually mean when it comes down to specific policies. Now, Christian nationalism has been in the news quite a bit lately, mostly because particularly extreme proponents of this view have been flat out stating their desire to make this a Christian nation. Now, the relationship between Christianity and our country is a complex and fascinating one. But I want to be very clear here. We are not just talking about particular views on familiar topics like prayer in public schools, or making space for different approaches to understanding the origins of the universe, or how we talk about faith in the public sphere. I'm talking about a particular political apocalyptic view, one that operates out of a specific understanding of how the end times will unfold, one whose agenda is driven by a firm belief that we can influence how these events will unfold. You see, although the details vary from group to group, there is a basic and widespread opinion among extreme Christian nationalists that the end of the world is a good thing. It's a good thing because it means that Jesus will come back and usher in the new heaven and new earth. Now, so far, so good. That does indeed seem to be what Scripture promises us. But where these groups begin to branch off from other versions of Christianity is through their insistence that this second coming is something that we can bring about, specifically by turning the United States into a Christian nation. Again, whatever that means. They operate as if Jesus is sitting around going, you know, I'm ready to come back, but I'm going to hold off and see how these midterms turn out. 
Now, if that's what you believe, then it follows that the most important thing you can do is to seize political power. To seize the reins of control so that you can steer the nation and the rest of the world in the right direction. But the question we have to ask ourselves is how this kind of apocalyptic perspective lines up with what we actually encounter in Scripture. What we actually see when Jesus talks about the inbreaking of the kingdom of God and how we are to conduct ourselves as we wait and prepare for his return. Taken together, these teachings we encounter in our scripture lesson this morning from Luke seem to argue in favor of a very different approach to doomsday prepping than most people expect. For example, there's no bunker mentality here. No instruction to retreat into the church or some closed-off community. Nor are there instructions to seize political power to take over the government in the name of Jesus. Instead, we are instructed to simply prepare and wait, and be ready. Prepare, wait, and be ready. But preparation does not take the form of stockpiling weapons and ammo or food or non-perishable items. Instead, we prepare by being generous. Jesus says, sell your possessions and give alms. And instead of using political or partisan means to seize control, we are told to make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. In other words, don't put all your stock in securing power here and now. Instead, look beyond the ways of this world. Put your trust not in a political party or an election, but rather in the promises of God. Being prepared means living the way Jesus taught us to pray. Living in anticipation that he may return at any moment. But that does not mean trying to take the place over while we wait. Jesus is less giving us instructions for how to take over the world, rather than giving us instructions for being good house-sitters. While I'm gone, I expect you to take care of the place, to keep things tidy, to feed my pets. And don't procrastinate on these chores, because I could come back at any moment. I'm going to a wedding party, and it might be horribly boring, and I'm back in an hour. Or it might be a really good party, and I won't be back until the wee hours of the morning. You never know when I might show up. I used to have a soccer coach who would give us specific instructions for our next practice, specific drills we were supposed to do. And then he would come up for some excuse about why he couldn't be at that practice. He'd say, well, I can't be there. I have a doctor's appointment. Then, of course, we'd show up at the field and go about our drills. And eventually, he would emerge from the forest or the bushes next to the field. He'd walk up with his hands on his waist, and he would say, good job, guys. I gave you instructions, and you didn't think I was here, but you did everything I asked of you. You have proven that you are responsible, reliable young men. We never had the heart to tell him that we knew he was there the whole time. We could see him moving around in the foliage, and he used to wear this big purple hat, so he didn't exactly blend in. Poor guy probably got Lyme disease from hanging out with all those ticks in the bushes. Wherever you are, coach, I hope you're doing okay. Jesus is clear that, there, that the uh, culmination of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God is not something that we as humans can control. We do not determine the schedule, and we cannot force anything to happen before God decides it will happen. And that is where all that thief language comes in towards the end of our scripture lesson. Be prepared, yes, but don't think that being prepared means that you can figure everything out, that you can figure out the timetable, or that you can rush things along. Christ has given us plenty of work to do while we wait. And the time and energy we spend trying to figure out or force specific outcomes is time and energy that we could be spending bearing witness to Christ through acts of generosity, service, kindness, and compassion. 
In fact, our attempts to force things along, our attempts to seize control through worldly means are less expressions of our faith or patience than they are expressions of our impatience and our lack of trust in God's promises. They are expressions of our fear and our anxiety and our desperate attempt to escape that fear and anxiety, to quiet that fear and anxiety by seizing control of our lives and the lives of other people. And that impatience and lack of trust can lead us to make questionable, truly destructive decisions, all in the supposed name of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. We know that because it's happened before. In 1932, a group known as the German Christians were formed within the larger German evangelical movement. The group was composed of pastors and theologians who were sympathetic to the growing nationalist socialist movement. And when Hitler was elected chancellor in 33, they got to work imposing their Nazi ideology upon the other churches in the German nation. Among other things, they emphasized the church's role as an extension of the state. They emphasized the importance of allegiance to the political party and most uh, importantly, to its leader, the Fuhrer. They emphasized, of course, the superiority of the German race, and they even went so far as to argue that any Christians with even a drop of Jewish blood should be excluded from participating in the church. Lurking beneath all of this was a well-defined, apocalyptic vision of what the future should look like and how it could be brought to life. Now, in response to the growing pressure from the German Christians, a counter-movement emerged within the German Evangelical Church Network. In May of 1934, 139 pastors and theologians from a variety of denominations met to approve a statement of opposition to the German Christians. The resulting document, commonly known as the Theological Declaration of Barman, or the Barman Declaration, is now enshrined as part of our Book of Confessions part of the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church, USA. The Declaration of Barman is designed to be a challenge to the tenets of the German Christians. It is a response piece by piece, claim by claim, an attempt to reveal where Nazi ideology had supplanted Scripture and created something that was trying to mimic Christianity, but that was, in truth, a dangerous, monstrous type of idolatry. We have put Barman in our book of confessions because it is one of the most powerful warnings that we have seen in history. One of the most powerful warnings we have seen that when the church and state attempt to become one, make no mistake, the state is calling the shots. Throughout Barman, there is the counterclaim that Christ alone is the Lord of the church. In its opening section, the Declaration of Barman cites our scripture lesson from the Gospel of Luke. It quotes it as a source of inspiration and hope in the face of mounting pressure from forces that wish to usurp the very gospel of Jesus Christ in the service of an insidious and genocidal agenda. It's a statement declaring that the church's vision of the future and the manner in which it conducts itself should adhere and be rooted in obedience to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, Christ as he is revealed in Scripture, not the agenda of a political party. Declaration states the following. If you find that we are speaking contrary to Scripture, then do not listen to us. If you find that we are taking our stand upon Scripture... And let no fear or temptation keep you from treading with us the path of faith and obedience to the word of God. In order that God's people be of one mind upon earth, and that we in faith experience what he himself has said to us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom.
voice of Barman, which speaks loudly to us today, reminds us that the kingdom of God is a gift we receive from God's grace. It is a gift of forgiveness, mercy, and love. It is not a political agenda we are permitted to impose upon others under the threat of violence. In the face of this disordered ideology masquerading as pious theology, the Barman Declaration stood sentinel against the rising tide of nationalism, nationalism that was exploiting the faith of the German people. As our political polarization deepens in our country and ramps up and talk about Christian nationalism increases, we must be prepared to do the same. The history of the German Christians is a sobering reminder of how easily we can be led astray when fear, anxiety, and hatred are allowed to take root in our hearts. But the Barman Declaration, and more importantly, our scripture lesson from Luke, remind us that there is a different path, a better path. There is a path of preparation and hope for the future, one that invites us to place our hope and trust not in the political machinations of human beings, not in national myths or in racist stereotypes, but rather solely in Jesus Christ and in the promises of God. The nation, we are frightened, anxious people right now. When you read the news, you can understand why. How wonderful it is, then. What good news it is that ours is a Savior who greets us even now with these words of comfort. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I'm going to remember that one of these days. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said that his disciples should be like servants waiting for their master to return home from a wedding banquet. He says that blessed are those who the Lord finds ready when he returns, for they will be invited to sit at table and he himself will serve them. We as Christians believe in the promise that Christ will return, a glorious return at the marriage of heaven and earth. But while we wait... We are able to prepare, and we can prepare by partaking in this feast, this feast that Jesus Christ himself offers to us, because this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Scripture tells us they shall come from north and south, from east and west, to sit at table at God's kingdom. And our Lord invites those who trust in him to take part in this meal that he has prepared. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. Please join me in prayer. It is right and our greatest joy, O Creator God, to give you our thanks and praise. For in the beginning you created the heavens and the earth, and out of darkness and chaos you brought light and order. You have given life to every living thing and made us in your image. And even when we turned away from you, you did not turn away from us. In the fullness of time, O Lord, you sent your Son to be Emmanuel, to be God with us. At his birth, the night sky lit up with the heavenly host and a guiding star. And even at his death, when the darkness of Gethsemane seemed to cover the earth, your light could not be snuffed out. Not even the grave could overcome the light of this world. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. In this feast, make us one with you and with each other, and guide us by your Spirit so that we might be united in ministry, and send us out into the world ready to serve others, ready to work for peace. Lord, we pray these things in all things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, after giving thanks, Jesus took bread and broke it, saying, This is my body, given for you. Take, eat, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Friends, as long as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. We invite you now to partake of the elements that you have before you. Please join me now in prayer. Gracious and abundant God, even as we wait for the fulfillment of your creation, even as we wait for your blessed return, you meet us at this table in this simple meal. We thank you for feeding us with the bread of life and quenching our thirst with the cup of salvation. Now send us out into your world by the power of your Holy Spirit to share your life and salvation with all whom we meet. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, we've been blessed to be nourished with Scripture, with prayer, with music. Now we must ask ourselves how we will respond to the gifts that we have been given. As always, we invite you to contribute financially to the ministry of this church. You can do so through our collection plate in the narthex or through ways to give through our website online. But we also invite you to invest your time, talent, and energy into the ministry of this church. In particular, we are excited to remind you that we do have our new music director, Diane, on board, and she has been hard at work laying the groundwork for our music program. The choir will be coming back, beginning their practice in September. We encourage you to give it a shot. Come add your voice to the wonderful group of people who are already singing it with us on Sunday mornings. Diane is also uh, reorganizing the handbell group. I know some of you are interested in that, and we would love to hear you come and ring. Give it a try. Give it a shot. We would love to hear your voice as part of this wonderful ministry at our church.
First of all, God be praised for the gift of music and for people with gifts for music and who are willing to share them in worship. Friends, please join me now in prayer. God of grace, who are we that you should care for us? Yet you surprise us with grace, you infuse us with hope, and you teach us a better way. As we lay, prepare ourselves to leave this place, to go back out into your world, make us ever more faithful and ever more grateful as we watch for the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We invite you to remain standing now and join in singing our hymn of sending. Before we leave this place today, we invite you to hang around for a while to enjoy the gift of Christian fellowship. Enjoy time with your fellow worshipers. We have coffee and refreshments in the narthex. Legend goes that the Declaration of Barman was penned by theologian Karl Barth after a tremendous amount of coffee and a couple very large Brazilian cigars. So we can help you out with the first part, but you're on your own for the other. Now, friends, go out into the world in faith as the people of God, and fear not. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God be with you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.